Do you want to know how I print miniatures, like these, that have come off of my hobbyist level FDM printer? Hey all, Jacob here from Painted for Combat, and today we're going to be breaking down every step of my process for printing FDM minis. We'll be looking at every stage, from picking minis and things to look out for in models, in which I'll cover my no-gos for FDM printing, as well as some of my favourite go-to sculptors, how to edit models that might need some alterations to have a better chance at a successful FDM print. We'll be going over my chosen slicer and slicer settings, as well as how I prefer to support models with clean printing and safe removal in mind. And finally, we'll be touching on support removal itself, model cleanup, and how I prep these minis for painting. Each section will be broken down in the video chapters below, so feel free to jump back and forth as you need, but I would recommend watching the video through all the way the first time round, as there'll be some great nuggets of information among the things that I've learned, having been on this path for a while. So without further ado, no more BS, let's get straight in. First thing first, picking a model. Not every model is suited for FDM printing. With resin printers becoming more and more capable of printing fine details, many sculptors are making the most of those capabilities. But not all those fine sculpts or thin details will make it through FDM printing. So let's take a look at some of my red flags for FDM printing, and on the flip side of that, some of my favourite sculptors to browse when looking for FDM printable miniatures. So we're going to have a look through my mini factory here, and try and identify some models that might not be so good for FDM printing. And in no way am I talking down or telling you not to purchase models from these creators. Every model that I'm going to be showing you here is one that I have purchased to print in resin. They just simply aren't compatible with FDM printing. Already, I'm immediately seeing something like this Undead Skeleton Swordsman, and I've printed some of this creator's models in the past in FDM, and some of them are really good. Something like this is definitely designed for resin, with very thin limbs and a very lifelike proportion. This Bone Claw from Epic Miniatures, while it is an awesome looking sculpt, has two problems when it comes to FDM printing. These incredibly thin limbs and even thinner claws are something that just would not survive FDM printing. As well as, these details on the chest are so subtly sculpted that only a resin printer would be able to pick those up. Similarly with this Triton from Rescale Miniatures, the detailing on this tail probably wouldn't be picked up on an FDM printer, and there's almost no way that this spear would survive being printed in PLA. A similar thing is happening with these antennas. They're thin and are not supported by anything at the back, so these are not going to survive. A model like this, while it is a gorgeous sculpt from Flesh of Gods, has a lot of very small and subtle details that probably won't show up on FDM, and if they do show up they're likely going to look more like print issues than actual details on the model. Another cool model here by Primal Collectibles, and this would make a great centerpiece if you were to print this in resin. Unfortunately, something like this probably wouldn't work well on an FDM printer. As you can see, we have some very thin objects that are suspended in the air, that are going to have to be caught by supports. And this goes for most character models that are more realistically proportioned. Things like thin limbs and realistically scaled weapons aren't going to go great on an FDM printer. And something like this shawl around her shoulders is going to be too thin to print in PLA. We're seeing a similar issue here, with this pirate captain, again by Epic Miniatures. The almost true to life human proportion is going to mean that these limbs are barely big enough for the print head to do more than a loop of plastic. And something as thin as this sword is just simply not going to get picked up in our slicer. And you can see the same thing happening here, with this miniature from Claymore Minis. Such a thin sword probably won't even be detected by our slicer, and a pole like this probably won't survive printing, and if it does none of this detail is going to be captured. And all of these suspended cloaks that are going to rely on support material will probably have issues in printing. On the other side of this, some creators have minis that are very well suited to FDM printing, albeit some of them needing a few touch-ups, which we'll cover soon. Artisans Guild make great heroic sculpts. These are not true scale minis, and a lot of features are blown up. Things like heads and hands are larger than they would be on an accurately proportioned human, and it's the larger more pronounced details like this that are going to make for better FDM printing. We can see the same theme here with one page rules, and these guys have some awesome minis for both Fantasy and Warhammer. You can see their sculpts are large, chunky details, and a lot of what would be subtle details on other sculptors actually protrude from the model a lot more than others. And with the larger details that are going to be overhanging here, these are going to be much easier to support using either manual or generated support materials. Some other sculptors that do a great job with these details are Bite the Bullet with their nice, chunky detailed characters, and some of Gallad Mini's library. Given not all of their models are going to be suited for FTM, but they do have a few that are going to be awesome. Caleb Makes Minis is a sculptor that I've recently discovered, and I really like their more stylized sculpting style. Something like this that is simple and clean with large details is going to go really well printing on an FTM printer. Similarly, Velrock Miniatures has an awesome style, 
that includes thick details and heroic proportions that will go great on FDM. Lost Adventures Co. is another one where some of their library is really good on an FDM printer. And if you're looking for larger scale models, specifically ancient dragons, Rescale Miniatures is a great place to look. Their large minis have a lot of detail, but at the scale that these dragons are, are pretty easy to print in FDM, given that you take enough time to support the model correctly. A lot of their minis that sit on larger 100mm bases are really good and I have a bunch of them on my shelf. Brings me on to Ve Victus. Now Ve Victus is an interesting sculptor. While they do match the same style as a lot of other miniature sculptors that has nice thick details and heroic proportions, some of their library will print without support materials. This model here is not an example of this, as this one will require supports, but some of their models can be printed without the use of support material. Another sculptor that is in this vein is Arbiter Minis. They have a nice clean style with large chunky details that will be easy to support, and half of their library also prints without support material at all. And finally we have creators like Evan Carthus, who do a lot of support free minis. As you can see here, these have been designed in a way that there are no angles over 45 degrees. And where there are, models will be cut so that you can print them in multiple pieces. And there's a lot of creators out there like this that do completely support free models. And if you'd like me to do a video covering some of my favourite support free model sculptors, feel free to leave a comment below and we can look at that later. But let's say that you want to print a mini like this kobold from Artisan's Guild and you're not sure if your printer is going to be able to handle the thin spell effects. How can we fix that? Here I'll be showing you how we might thicken up details like this to make models more FDM compatible. And full disclosure, I will be touching on using Blender here, but I'm going to try and keep it brief and simple at an anyone can do this type level. But if you're really not interested, feel free to skip this section and jump ahead. For this I'll be making use of Blender's sculpting toolkit. First off, we're going to open Blender. Greeted by this screen, we can simply click off into the viewport. We want to get rid of all those default objects, so on your keyboard hit the A key and then the delete key. This will remove those models from the scene. Next we can come up to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and search for STL. Here we need to enable STL support as 99% of 3D printable models will be exported as STL, and this add-on allows us to bring those into Blender. With that done, we can simply come up to File, Import, STL, and find our mini wherever it might be on your PC. Simply click the file, or control click to select multiple, and then hit Import. STL files tend to be large, so this might take a couple of seconds, but don't worry, Blender hasn't crashed, it's just processing. With our model in, it will be helpful to reorient it, and center it within the workspace. If your model is not located in the center of the screen where the axes meet, You'll want to start by going to the outliner, making sure your model is selected, then right click somewhere in the viewport. Set origin, origin to geometry. Then finally in the top right of the viewport we can click object, clear, location. This will bring the model to the center of the workspace. From here we can simply click the rotate icon if the model needs rotating, and by holding down control to snap rotation to 5 degree increments, we can drag on any of these circles to rotate in that direction until the model is upright. Then we can select the transform tool, Move the model up so it is roughly at floor level, and we're ready to sculpt. If you need to change what model is selected, you can get your cursor back by selecting the selection icon here. For beginners, I find it easy enough to use these controls to move around your model. Simply click and drag these icons to rotate, move, or zoom the camera. And if at any point your camera is not pivoting around the correct object, select your model and go to View, Frame Selected. And this will center the camera on your selected model. To access the sculpting tools, we will want to select our model, and then select the Mode drop-down, and change from Object Mode to Sculpting Mode. This will now lock us in to be sculpting the selected model. If you want to change your selected model at any point, simply go back to Object Mode and change your selection there. With all that done, onto the fun part. The only brush we will be needing is the Inflate brush, which you can see here. Either click it, or simply hit I on the keyboard to swap to this brush. By hovering our model we can now see the size of the brush and by right clicking we can change both the size and the strength of this tool. Now you can simply click or drag over the parts you want to inflate. You can use Ctrl Z to undo strokes you don't like, and Ctrl Y to redo if needed. So now take your time, move around the model, inflating thin areas as you see fit, changing the brush size and strength as needed. This is a good time to mention that many of the menus, navigation icons and tools all have hotkey equivalents that allow you to more rapidly maneuver Blender. These can be found in other tutorials on YouTube if you want to become more proficient at the program, but I wanted to keep everything here basic and visual for this overview. With our model ready for slicing, we can go back to object mode. Make sure our model is selected, then go to File, Export, STL. I'd like to turn on Selection only, just in case there are other objects in the scene. And then we can name and save our model. 
time to slice. When it comes to FDM miniatures, I cannot recommend Prusa Slicer enough. It may have a few downfalls and a few missing features, but this free slicer will be absolutely critical when it comes to adding supports to our model later. Overall, my settings are somewhat standard. No tricksy techniques or slicing hacks like I know we've all had to rely on in the past. Just some good dialed in numbers that make the most of modern FDM printers. Let's take a look at some of my settings. So these are specifically dialed in for my Elegoo Neptune 3 Pro with the Elegoo filament, but you can use your own intuition to figure out which of these settings will apply to your printer as well. Firstly, in layers and perimeters, my layer height is going to be 0.08. The only reason that it is 0.08 is that this is the recommended minimum for my printer. The best way to find this is if your Impressa Slicer and your printer came in as a default option, just look at the lowest possible layer height here. Uh, I like to go off of this because this is usually indicative of the stepper motor in the printer, but it is also worth doing some research on that. For this, 0.08 is the preferred minimum layer height for the printer. First layer height, I tend to vary between 0.2 and 0.25, just to get a nice even thick layer down for that first layer. Perimeters, I tend to keep on three minimum. Two perimeters can sometimes see infill showing through gaps, and any thin details can sometimes feel a little weak. Three is a good number, four you could do if you wanted a little bit of extra rigidity, but I feel that it just bumps up print time too much. Now for top and bottom layers. I keep my top layers on four and my bottom on three, but you could very easily bump both of these numbers up by one or two. When it comes to the quality settings here, I keep avoid crossing perimeters on. This stops the print head trying to double over areas it's already printed, which should help with prints not getting knocked off the print bed. And I leave that at one millimeter. Thick bridges is off while detect bridging perimeters is on. For seam position, I like to align these to rear. This means that as long as your model is facing forward on the print bed, the seams will be placed at the back of the model. And I 100% recommend changing perimeter generator to classic. Arachne can be really good, as it will allow the printer to print thinner layers, in the sense that it will increase and decrease the flow rate as necessary. However, I find that this often leads to poor detail or holes in small minis. Classic is much better and will make sure that your mini is solid and sturdy the whole way through. Jumping down to infill, I've dropped this down to 13% as I find that this number works fine. And I've just kept this on grid because it's what I'm familiar with. The other infill pattern that I might recommend would be gyroid. Other than that, the infill settings have been left mostly at default. Skirts and brims. If a mini has its base attached to the model or has a large enough footprint on the print bed, I don't tend to use skirts or brims. However, if the mini is freestanding and is only attached to the print bed by, say, its feet, then I will use a brim in this case. I tend to make the brim width anywhere between 5 to 8 millimeters, depending on the size of the mini, and I keep the separation gap just slightly under my print head. This should mean that as long as our first layer is extruding well, they are making enough contact that that brim will hold the mini to the print bed, but not so much that it will be impossible to remove later. A separation of anywhere between 0.2 and 0.3 has been fine for me when I'm using a 0.4mm nozzle. Now, support material. This is important. This is why I'm using Prusa Slicer. Generate support material, obviously, is turned on, and auto generate supports is off. My first layer density is set to 100, with my first layer expansion on 6mm. This first layer expansion acts like a brim for the supports. Unfortunately, this cannot be increased in height, only in width. Being able to increase this in height would be nice, as it would allow us to do two or three layers before the support started printing. And this would help eliminate the rare case in which supports are knocked off the print bed. I don't use rafts, but this is something that you could look at if you were printing minis that were really having a hard time adhering to the build plate. Now, the important stuff. Our support style is set to organic. For top contact Z distance, this is the distance between the top of the supports and your model. I tend to keep this just slightly above my layer height at 0.1. This just means that any angled support area will still have enough distance that a model will connect to it but not be held in place too tight. I keep width sheath around the support on. Mostly everything else here is default. I keep X and Y separation between object and support at 120%, just to make sure that models aren't attached too closely to the mini. And I make sure to turn don't support bridges on. For the organic support settings down here, I keep my maximum branch angle at 30 degrees and my preferred branch angle at 25. This is the angle at which the support will grow from the build plate. And having these numbers any higher, allowing for 35, 40 degree supports, ends up with a lot of those supports getting knocked over by the print head, as they're just simply not as sturdy. My branch diameter hovers anywhere between 1.25 and 1.45. At the moment this is set to 1.35, as this is a nice middle ground that I find works best for most minis. 
and my branch diameter angle is 4. Branch diameter with double walls. This is for any of the bases of your supports at their largest areas. Rather than doing a single wrap of filament around that support, it will instead do two layers, making sure that they're nice and sturdy. Tip diameter I leave at 1mm, along with branch distance. And for branch density I leave that at 15%, though I'm not sure how much this actually influences the paint on supports. Jumping over to speed. Now this is something that I find is more specific per printer, but this is a good baseline to go off. Perimeters at 50, with small perimeters at 35. External perimeters also at 35, and infill at 55. Solid infill at 50, top solid infill at 32, and support material at 35. Support material interface can be left default at 100%, bridges is dropped to 32, and gap fill can stay at 30. I find that these settings are a great middle ground between speed and quality. I haven't found any increase in quality by decreasing these speeds, and in fact a lot of the time it leads to the plastic oozing or being pushed around on the model. So having a speed that isn't too slow and isn't too fast is critical. Everything else in this category has been left at the default settings. Multiple extruders I have not touched, and in advance the extrusion width is dialed into my printer. This is what I have found works best for me to get nice solid walls that are mostly dimensionally accurate. Again, this is a good baseline, but don't rely on my settings here, make sure this is dialed in for your printer. My default extrusion width is 0.45, with my first layer at 0.42. From there, everything is 0.45 until we get to top solid infill, which I've left at 0.4, and support material at 0.41. This just makes sure that everything is a nice solid wall. Infill perimeter overlap is at 25%, and everything else here should be roughly at default. For retraction settings, this is very dependent on printer and filament, and will likely be changed between filaments. My retraction length for the Elegoo filament on the Elegoo Neptune 3 Pro is 2.65, with the retraction speed at 30mm a second. And that wraps up our print settings. As you can see, a lot of stuff has been left at default, and everything else has just been dialed in over a lot of trial and error. So feel free to plug these numbers into your copy of Prusa Slicer, and then tweak a few of those values until you find what works for your printer. Now we can move on to actually bringing in our model, and adding some manual supports. Manual supports. Not a typical step of FDM printing, and it is optional, but I find it goes a long way in increasing both the quality of overhangs and the success rate of prints overall. It also makes removing slicer generated supports so much easier in future steps. In the past, this is another step I would have done in Blender. However, I have created a way to do this directly in Prusa, by making use of my custom support tower models that I have created which you can find in the video description. And while you're down there, please consider liking the video if it's been helpful so far, and subscribe to see more cool mini printing and painting in the future. The support towers come in all manner of heights, with both straight and angled options. These towers are designed to have the perfect size at the top for a 0.4mm nozzle to do a single ring of material. As such, these towers should not be scaled down, but should instead be scaled up to match the height you need. Just make sure to grab the closest size model to your desired height as to not scale them too much. If you need a tower that is shorter than the ones provided, take one of the straight towers and scale it down on the Z axis only. I use these manual supports on problem areas of a model. For example, those details that are too close to other parts of the model for slicer supports to reach. Things like humanoid chins. Or curving overhangs that peel off support interface after a few layers, like pipes or chains. Or finally, points that wiggle free of the support material around them, like claws or sword hilts. So I'm going to show you a few examples here and how I use these towers to combat them. Firstly, I identify these problem areas, and I use Prusa's built-in cylinders to gauge the height of these details. With those heights in mind, I bring in a tower that is as close to that height rounded down as possible. If the detail I am supporting has a model under it that a straight tower would hit, I'll make sure to use an angled one to avoid other parts of the model. And I will repeat this for as many details as I feel necessary, without going overboard. Remember, I'm not supporting every overhang here, only the ones that Prusa's slicer supports might not quite catch, or support 100%. Once I'm happy with the manual support placement, I merge all the support models with my mini in the outliner. This means that Prusa will now treat this as a single model, and won't overlap material. Now you might be wondering, why not use a resin slicer to add these tower style supports? And that's perfectly valid, you absolutely could. I just don't want to be jumping through that many hoops and back and forthing that much, when all I really need is two or three towers per model. Now we can move on to the slicer supports themselves, and as we covered in the slicer settings section, we will be using the settings on screen now for Prusa Slicer's awesome organic supports. 
After a lot of fiddling, these are the settings that I have found most reliable for printing, but also for support removal once the print is finished. A fine balancing act that took me a fair few models to get just right. I do not let Prusa Slicer auto-generate these supports, however. Prusa will try and support a bunch of hard-to-reach areas and details that don't actually call for support material, which will both bump up print time and make it harder to remove the support material later. Instead, we change the support settings to be for support enforcers only, and select the Paint on Supports tool. Now I go around the model filling in any areas that have overhangs or islands, telling Prusa that this is where I need supports to be generated. One final thing, when it comes to setting up a print for any model like this that has a sword blade, staff, or any singular thin detail that is rising above the model, I like to add a cooling tower of sorts. Just something else on the print bed that will allow this fine detail to actually solidify between layers, rather than just piling molten plastic on still molten layers. To do this, I copy the height of our mini, and create a cube with the same height. I then change the X and Y to both be 5mm. And if we slice this now, we can see that between the layers of our model, it will print this cube. But it doesn't need to be this solid, it just needs to separate our layers. So to set this up, I add two attributes to our cube. Infill density, as well as layers and perimeters. I change fill density and top solid layers both to 0, and then set perimeters to 1. This will create a simple shell that will print alongside our model and use less than a gram of filament. And once I think I have everything supported and ready to go, I run a slice and scroll up and down the mini, searching for any areas that are printing in the air or look ill-supported. And after a few rounds of back and forthing, adding extra supports where needed, we can run our final slice. And now we print. My current printer, as mentioned, is an Elegoo Neptune 3 Pro, and I'm also going to be using Elegoo's PLA today, as I find it gives a nice strong print that has a little bit more flexibility before snapping than other PLAs. And this video is in no way endorsed or sponsored, this is simply the printer I own and the best PLA I've found for the price. You will want to make sure that your printer is dialed in and leveled properly when printing at a machine's minimum layer height. I have found that if your printer isn't leveled correctly, it will often lead to the printhead bumping the slicer supports and snapping them off or just lifting a whole mini from the build plate. If your printer does manage to break one of the supports, I do just tend to keep an eye on the print for a while and let it continue. These organic supports tend to gather near their tops and can often catch a single broken support. And just like that, we have an FDM mini. Well, almost. We need to release it from its prison of support material first. My favourite method for this is to first take your nippers, and preferably a cheap pair that come with the printer, and not any nice ones you might use on model kits. With these clippers, cut any of our manual support towers that are accessible, and remove those. Then clip any of the easy to cut trunks of these organic supports to disconnect them from one another. And then start peeling away material. Rather than chopping or cutting, I find that peeling the support material back will help in making sure you don't damage the print underneath. Obviously some areas will require actual clipping, pulling or twisting to get the supports off. And after a few minis, you'll get a sense of how rough you can be on the supports and what works best for your PLA. When it comes to model cleanup, I like to focus on any large issues and easy to fix areas. When it comes to FDM minis, it's okay to accept that some parts just might not look perfect. It's better to try and draw attention away from those in the paint job rather than spending hours cleaning up an FDM model. I tend to focus on cleaning up areas where our tower supports connected to the model, slicing away any ugly overhangs to a smoother finish, and nicking off any little blobs that might have been caused by overhanging plastic not quite hitting support material. If there are any minor layer shifts or protruding lines, I clean those up the same way you would a mold line on any plastic model. When it comes to getting these minis ready for painting, I like to hit them with a spray primer. If you're using FDM bases with your minis, I would recommend attaching them to their bases first. I use Rust-Oleum spray primer, it's great for FDM. Rust-Oleum, while still a nice thin paint, isn't quite as thin as something like a Citadel spray. What this means is that the slightly thicker consistency will help to hide a few layer lines, but won't go so far as to remove any of the detail that's been captured in the model. And I usually just do one or two layers. I'll stop at one layer if the model looks fine after that, but if there's a few too many layer lines poking through then I'll hit it with a second coat. And I'll very rarely, if ever, do more than that. And there you have it, FDM miniatures from a well-priced, modern, hobbyist level printer that will be perfect for almost any tabletop. If you'd like to know how my settings differ for printing larger models, just let me know down below. I'd be more than happy to do a follow-up video in the future. And if you think there's anything that I missed, any questions you have, or any advice that you have for everyone here, feel free to leave that in the comments below as well. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you want to see more of my printing and painting in the future, and leave a like if this video was helpful for you. And as always, have a good one.